بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My goal in this series of presentations is to show why Islam is true. I'm doing this by taking the statement Islam is true as a claim in which the word Islam refers to the large claim that God created the universe, put us in it for a great purpose, and sent us messengers to tell us our purpose so that we might gain eternal happiness in our life after death. I'm proceeding in this series of presentations by breaking this large claim into a series of subclaims, beginning with the most important subclaim, namely the claim that God exists. In the second presentation, I demonstrated that God exists, arguing that the contingency of the universe is evidence for the existence of a necessary being. In the next presentation, I explained that necessary existence is the most important distinguishing characteristic that sets the concept of God, that sets God himself apart from everything else. And I explained that what it means for God to be a necessary being is that he needs nothing and everything else needs him. I then proceeded to examine a uh, materialist objection to the argument for God's existence and I um, explained that objection and responded to it in the previous presentation. In this presentation I'm going to consider another objection, an objection that is raised by scientists who imagine that science has disproved the existence of God. This objection runs like this. Someone proves that God exists, as I did in the previous three presentations. And the scientists object that people only believed in God in previous times because they couldn't explain the way that natural phenomena happened. And they therefore feared them. They feared the eclipse, the volcano, the earthquake. And they invented the concept of God so that they could pray to him to protect them from these natural phenomena. When science came along, it explained the true causes of these natural phenomena, thereby saving them from their ignorance and fear. Two observations about this objection. The first is that it's what logicians call an ad hominem argument. An ad hominem argument is one that attacks the intelligence of one's opponent without engaging their argument. Theists actually have an argument for the existence of God. I explained one of these arguments in the previous three presentations. This objection does not object to the argument. It doesn't, even, it doesn't say anything about it. It therefore does not even constitute an objection to the argument. The second thing to note is that it is what logicians call a straw man argument. Not only does it not address the argument, it actually misrepresents the argument. It twists the argument into something foolish in order to make it an easy target for ridicule. Let me illustrate this straw man argument with the example of a solar eclipse. 4,000 years ago, the ancient Chinese, they believed that solar eclipses were caused by sun-eating dragons. There was a dragon somewhere up there that was hungry and it was trying to eat the sun. This, according to the straw man argument, is an example of a supernatural explanation. It's called a supernatural explanation because it explains a natural phenomenon, a solar eclipse in this example, without reference to natural processes. It just thinks up and invents an imaginary dragon. These supernatural explanations, according to the straw man argument, are based on fear. So the ancient Chinese, they were scared that they would lose the sun. And the sun is the source of life, the source of light, the source of warmth. And so they imagined that there was a dragon that was trying to eat up the sun and then they beat their pots and drums in order to scare away the dragon so that their precious sun would remain unharmed and they would still gain their life, their warmth and their light from the sun 
and it seemed to work every time because they banged their pots and their drums and the dragon went away. Supernatural explanations are based on uh, no evidence. They're not based on any evidence. The dragon is just imagined and they therefore constitute not knowledge but ignorance. These supernatural explanations according to those who present uh, according to the straw man argument um, is called superstition. Then modern science came along and it explained the phenomenon of the solar eclipse with reference to natural processes. A solar eclipse, we now know, is caused by the moon passing in between the sun and the earth, obscuring the sun from our view. This explanation is not a supernatural explanation, but a natural explanation because it refers to natural processes. This explanation is not based on fear, according to the Strawman argument, but instead it's based on a curiosity to discover the truth. And it searches for evidence, so it's an evidence-based explanation. And this makes it not ignorance, but knowledge. And that is the difference between science and superstition. The ancient Chinese were not alone in their superstition. They believed that the sun was being eaten by hungry dragons. The Vietnamese believed that eclipses were not caused by hungry dragons, but by hungry frogs. Um, in Hindu mythology, uh, they believed that the eclipses, solar eclipses, were caused by a battle between the gods in which the head of a, an assassinated god, the deca his decapitated head, chased the sun and the moon and tried to eat them up. Um, and in the shamanistic uh, religions of, the, uh, of some of the Native Americans, um, it was uh, believed that the spirits of the dead were trying to eat up the, the, the sun and the moon and they would uh, do these ritual dances and, uh, and sing these ritual songs in order to stop them from eating up the sun and the moon and uh, they never did and it appeared to work. This is what misinformed scientists mean when they object that people have historically believed in God not based on evidence but because they feared natural phenomena and then science saved them from their ignorance and their fear. As I just explained, this is an ad hominem attack on the intelligence of theists that simply ignores their arguments. It therefore does not constitute an objection at all. Not only is it an ad hominem argument, it also misrepresents the position of theists by making two claims that are false. It claims that people have historically believed in God without evidence, even though, in fact, as I will show shortly, they have historically believed in God based on evidence. And it, has, and it claims that belief in God conflicts with science, even though, as I will now show, it actually coexists with science. Let's take the first claim, that people have believed in God without evidence. I've explained an argument for God's existence in detail in the second presentation and then in even more detail in the two presentations that followed it. If you've watched those presentations, you have seen that the argument for God's existence is clear and compelling. But what you might not have realized is that the argument is also simple and straightforward and actually doesn't need the detailed presentations that I gave. Because the argument is simple and straightforward, ordinary people, untrained in philosophy or theology, have used it throughout history. Muslim historians tell the story of a desert Bedouin who was asked how he came to know about the existence of God. He responded using an example from his desert surroundings. He said that footprints in the desert sand, in other words, indicate that someone walked and camel droppings in the desert sand as well indicate that a camel passed. Shouldn't then the constellation filled heaven and the valley filled earth indicate that they were made by the all wise and all knowing creator? This is a very simple and straightforward presentation of the argument that I explained in the second, third and fourth presentations. It can be stated simply 
by saying that the universe is an effect. This is what theologians and philosophers mean when they say that the universe is contingent. The universe is an effect, and since, an, since it's an effect, it needs something other than it to make it be the case. So the universe is an effect that could only have been brought about by a being who doesn't need anything. By God, in other words, or in the terminology of theologians and philosophers, a necessary being. This simple and straightforward argument is the argument that the Quranic verses that I have cited are making. The Bedouin expressed the simple and straightforward argument using footprints and camel droppings. The Quran expresses it using other facts, the heavens and the earth, the night and the day, ships in the sea, rain, animals, winds, clouds. These are all great and numerous signs because they are all effects. They are all effects, contingent things in other words, that could only have been brought about by God or in other words a necessary being who needs nothing but who is needed by everything else. The first claim that people have believed in God without evidence is therefore false. It misrepresents the arguments of theists in order to make them an easy target for refutation. The straw man argument also misrepresents their arguments by claiming that belief in God conflicts with science. This misrepresentation is based on the incorrect assumption that natural processes like solar eclipses can only be explained through one of two mutually exclusive ways. The first of these mutually exclusive ways is by reference to divine action. Scientists who construct this straw man argument derogatively refer to this kind of explanation as a supernatural explanation and then negatively associate it with fairy tales of hungry dragons, frogs, divine beings with their, whose heads have been cut off and powerful spirits. The second way in which we can explain natural phenomena, this Strawman argument goes, is with reference to natural processes. And so the second way in which we could explain the solar eclipse, for example, is with reference to the motion of the earth around the sun and the moon around the earth. Scientists positively call this kind of explanation, this evidence-based explanation, a natural explanation. Now, there are two things that are wrong with what I just presented. The first is that God is not a fairy tale. Whereas hungry dragons, frogs, divine beings, and spirits that chase after the sun and try to eat it up are not based on ev any evidence at all, belief in God is based on evidence. Explaining natural phenomena with respect to God's action is therefore not like explaining natural phenomena with respect to mythical creatures like the ones that we just mentioned. The second thing that's wrong with what I just presented is that the either-or dilemma between explaining natural phenomena with reference to divine action and between explaining them with respect to natural processes is a false dilemma because natural phenomena can be explained with reference to both at the same time without there being any conflict whatsoever. For example, the verse from the Quran that I have cited frequently since the second presentation in this series, it describes God as being the one who sends down the rain and it describes God as the one who brings forth vegetation from the earth after the rain falls. But it says that God brings forth the vegetation through the rain. This means that even though God is governing the universe and running everything, he establishes a relation between rain and the growth of vegetation. And this relation we can discern through empirical reasoning and we can equally explain the sprouting forth of 
vegetation with reference to the rain or with reference to God. Similarly, God is the one who moves the winds and changes their direction. And God is the one who makes the clouds swirl. But because he runs the universe in a coherent and regular way, there is a relation between the changing of the winds and the swirling of the clouds, because of which we can equally say that it's the winds that swirl the clouds. Belief in God, therefore, does not conflict with science because God governs the universe, he runs the universe in a scientifically coherent way, establishing relations between the various things that he creates. And we can, we can infer these relations, we can see these relations through scientific reasoning. Another way to say this is that we can view natural phenomena from the perspective of the foreground that we see and the background that lies behind them. From the perspective of the foreground, we see natural processes in association with each other. From the perspective of the background, we see or infer divine action. Let's take the example of the water cycle. If we begin the cycle at the oceans, then the first step is that the water in the oceans begins to evaporate as a result of the heat of the sun. We can see this natural phenomenon from the perspective of the foreground in which the evaporation is caused by the heat of the sun, or we can view it from the perspective of the background in which the evaporation and the heat of the sun are both divine action. The next step is the water vapor rises. It rises because it's lighter than air and the air comes down as a result of gravity and the water vapor goes up. As it goes higher, the temperature drops and the water vapor condenses into clouds. We can view this phenomenon from the perspective of the gravity that pushes the air down and the water vapor up and the dropping temperatures that uh, result in the water vapor condensing into a cloud or we can view it as divine action in which God creates the wa water vapor, God makes it rise, God creates the condensation, God creates the gravity, God creates the cold temperature. Winds then move the clouds through the atmosphere over land and the winds generally move from the land from the sea onto the land because the water in the sea has a higher heat capacity as a result of which the temperature of the air over the, the water is generally lower than the temperature of the air over land. Uh, this creates a difference in air pressure and causes the wind to move from the sea towards the land pushing the clouds towards the land. We can view this natural phenomenon from the perspective of air pressure or we can view it from the perspective of divine action. God is the one who created the winds. God is the one who created the difference in air pressure. God is the one who created the clouds and moved them. Then as, uh, as, the, uh, as the clouds get larger and larger, um, the water droplets, they fall down from the clouds as drizzle, rain, snow, or ice. Um, we can view this from the perspective of gravity pulling down the drops of uh, water or ice or snow into the uh, on, onto the land or we can view everything as divine action in the background that is creating all of these phenomena in a regular way in a scientifically coherent way placing relations between them that we can understand through empirical reasoning and so on down the water cycle until the water eventually comes back into the oceans. Since we can understand natural phenomena both in terms of natural processes and in terms of divine action, belief in God does not conflict with science. If we now return to the example with which I illustrated the straw man argument of scientists who don't believe in God, you will see that since belief in God is based on evidence, it is not the same as believing that solar eclipses are caused by hungry dragons, nor is it based on ignorant fear, nor is it superstitious. 
that God exists is a fact that is corroborated by evidence. Now, since most of us associate the word supernatural with baseless fantasy, a more meaningful way to refer to the explanation of natural phenomena by reference to divine action is to call it a background explanation, as I just explained in the example of the water cycle, or the ultimate explanation of natural phenomena, rather than to call it a supernatural explanation. It should also be clear that atheist scientists who refute belief in God by refuting hungry dragons are refuting a straw man. They're refuting something that their opponent does not even advocate. Belief in God is not based on ignorant fear. Belief in God is based on evidence. And since there is no conflict between belief in God and science, instead of setting up an opposition between science and quote-unquote superstitious belief in God, it is more accurate to simply demand that all human beliefs, whether religious beliefs or scientific beliefs, be based on evidence. And instead of calling scientific explanations natural explanations in order to contrast them with conflicting supernatural ones, it is more accurate to call them foreground explanations or proximate explanations that are complemented by the background or ultimate explanation of natural phenomena by reference to divine action. We are now in a position to respond to the objection with which I began this presentation. It is not the case that people have believed in God because they feared natural phenomena. Rather, people have believed in God because there is clear evidence for his existence. It is also not the case that science has saved believers in God from their ignorance and fear because there is no scientific reasoning that conflicts with the evidence for the existence of God. Although I've put this objection to rest, I'm sure that all of you have a question in your minds that requires a clarifying addendum to this presentation. That question probably looks something like this. Isn't it the case that ancient religious beliefs in hungry dragons, hungry frogs, assassinated gods and powerful spirits have all been corrected in some way by science? And since these ancient beliefs are always justified through belief in God, shouldn't science give us reason to be suspicious of God? The answer is that we need to separate between belief in God and between belief in the religious doctrines of specific religions. The reason why certain religions believed in hungry dragons, hungry frogs, assassinated gods and powerful spirits was that they were man-made. And because they were man-made, they elevated superstition to the level of religious doctrine. When modern science came along, it exposed the falsehoods of these superstitions. And by so doing, it exposed the falsehoods of man-made religions. So it exposed the falsehoods of religious doctrines that elevated superstition to the level of, re of, of religious truth. However, it didn't expose the falsehood of belief in God because belief in the existence of God, a necessary being who sustains the universe and brings it into being, is different than belief in man-made addendums to this uh, to the to the existence of this being whose existence we know by evidence islam is not a man-made religion once during the end of the prophet's career sallallahu alaihi wasallam when his son died in infancy the sun eclipsed the ancient Arabs, they had a belief in the effect of celestial phenomena on human life. And in particular, they believed that the sun only eclipsed because of the life or the death of some important person. This was not different from the belief of the ancient Chinese who held that the emperor had dragon blood within him and the events in the heavens, such as solar eclipses, were related to the life and death of the emperor of the, or of the current ruling dynasty. The Prophet ﷺ, he uh, 
he rejected these beliefs and he said uh, that the, verily the sun and the moon neither eclipse because of someone's death nor because of their birth but they are merely two of God's signs they are God's signs because they are contingent phenomena that need someone to make them be so he said when you see them then pray we're going to talk about prayer in presentation number 13 when we'll talk about worshipping the one God uh, but for now, what I want to focus on is that the Prophet wasallam could have um, elevated his own importance and the importance of his son by claiming that the eclipse of the sun showed the importance of the death of, of his son. Uh, but he didn't. Uh, he said that that's not the case. And this is because Islam is not a man-made religion. There are many other signs and indicators and proofs, in fact, that Islam is not a man-made religion and that's what this entire series is about. But if we return now to the focus of this present presentation, namely God and science, I want to tell you to stay tuned because there will be several future presentations in which, God willing, I'll show that whereas modern science has exposed the falsehoods of man-made religions, it's actually corroborated the truth of Islam. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله